Good All right, everybody. Once, once we Good afternoon. Sign up. Yeah. Um, welcome to the May 2nd, 2023 Denver Land Mark Preservation Commission. Yes. Uh, we begin, um, well, first of all, I'd like to welcome people. We have actual people here, um, as well as, as those of you joining us virtually. So welcome, everybody. Um, the first thing we do is we introduce uh, our uh, commissioners. And so I will go ahead and begin. My name is Julie Johnson. I am a historic preservation project manager, and I was nominated by the community at large. Nick, would you like to start? Sure. Um, Nick Fusianis, and I was nominated by the American Institute of Architects. I'm Ann Mottenberg. I'm an architect, and I was also nominated by the American Institute of Architects. Hello, I'm Gary Petrie. I'm an architect and was nominated by the Denver Planning Board. Hello, I'm George Dennis, a retired law enforcement. I live in historic home. <laughs> and we're going to pause for just, thank you, George. We're going to pause for just a second to see if we can fix the echo. I think it's my computer, but I don't know why. Is your mic on? No. It's the sound. It's all the way down. Can someone come up here and assess me? Sorry, folks. It's you know, this is what happens sometimes. When you live in the most of this day today. <laughs> well, I was going to say that out loud. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, didn't mean to play I'm Brittany Bryant, Landmark Preservation Staff. All right, thank you. Um, at the beginning of every meeting, we um, like to have uh, set aside a couple of minutes for um, anybody from the public, uh, virtually or here in person, that would like to talk on historic preservation in Denver in general. This is not actual project, um, but this is just in general. If somebody would like to make a comment, um, this is the time to do it. And if, if anybody here? It doesn't look like it. If there's anybody online, then you can use your little hand function. No hands raised. No hands raised. All right. Um, then, uh, since there aren't any public comments, uh, general public comments, uh, we will um, talk about some audio tips for the virtual participants so that you can hear and we can hear you. Uh, for better sound quality, we uh, encourage you to download Zoom on your desktop, laptop, tablet, or mobile device. Uh, you can click audio settings to bring up an additional menu, add a background noise suppression, and test your speaker and microphone and adjust the maximum output volumes to make sure they're working. For presenters or public commenters, when it is your turn to speak, uh, to mute or unmute, click on the microphone icon at the bottom of your screen and expanding the menu next to the microphone will reveal additional options like select your speaker and microphone devices, test your microphone and speakers, adjust their maximum output volumes. If you still have audio challenges, you can switch to uh, a phone for audio. All right, um, then commissioners, we don't have any meeting records uh, to approve at this time. Uh, but we do have a consent agenda. Um, these are routine design review items recommended for commission approval without discussion. Applicants with items passed on the consent agenda should coordinate separately with their landmark preservation staff to receive a certificate of appropriateness. There is no public comment for consent agenda items. I will announce uh, the consent agenda by address. Um, the chairs will ask the commission. The chair will ask the commissioner if um, there's a desire to remove any items. If you have any concerns or questions, um, the commissioner has to be removed to put discussed during the regular design review. Uh, commission members will announce any conflicts of interest on any items. Um, the commission will then. Uh, 
to do a motion and we'll vote on that. So uh, first of all, I'll introduce the projects. Um, they are 2023-COA-130 at 224 South Lincoln Street and 2023-COA-146 at 317 back on the street in Baker. Commissioners, are there any concerns, anything anybody wants to take off the agenda? Any conflicts of interest? All right. Then do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I can make a motion. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda, which consists of application number 2023-COA-130 at 224 South Lincoln Street and application number 2023-COA-146-137 Akama Street. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, uh, can I offer a friendly amendment? I think you said 147, it's 317 Akama Street. Oh, I accept. Okay, Nick? I think so. Thank you. All right, uh, commissioners, all in favor, aye. Aye. Right. Right. Aye. All right, uh, the consent agenda has been approved, and if you are online or uh, online for a consent agenda, um, you can continue to join our meeting if you wish, but you're free to um, get off the line now if you'd like to. Um, we do have, um, in our next section, we have public hearings. The first item is uh, actually setting a public hearing for uh, one, one item. And that's 2023 LMTEMO 104 at 95 Atlantic Street in the Baker neighborhood. Uh, this is for a total demolition. Uh, and our recommendation is to set a public hearing for June 6, 2023. Um, commissioners, did I hear a motion to set the set date? I did want to clarify too that it is um, for the accessory structure on the site and not the front end structure. Thanks, Brittany. I can make the motion. Well, thank you, Ed. Madam Chair, I move to um, I to set a public hearing for application number twenty twenty three LMDEMO dash one hundred four at ninety four Bannock Street in Baker for June sixth of twenty twenty three. Second. All right. Another friendly amendment. I think it's 95 and extreme. Oh, so sorry. It's okay to accept, right? Yes. Okay, awesome. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Okay. All right. Then um, 2023 LMDEMO 104 will come back to us for a public hearing on June 6, 2023. Okay. So I'll go ahead and open the public. So our next is an actual public hearing. The public hearing process. I will announce um, the public hearing by address and the commission members will announce any um, conflicts of interest that you might have at this public hearing. Um, the staff will introduce the application and recommendation. And commissioners, of course, can question the staff if they have any questions. Um, the applicant presentation is limited to 10 minutes. Uh, commissioners may question the applicant. Uh, public comment period. Uh, each uh, individual who wishes to comment has three minutes per person. If you would like to speak regarding a specific project and you are not part of that applicant team, please click the hand raise button for those of you calling. Uh, for those of you calling via the phone, dial nine to raise your hand or email lambert.org prior to the public comment period. Um, and then anybody that's here, obviously, can raise your hands and give you all a chance for your few minutes of public comment. Um, then the uh, staff can clarify uh, after all the public comments if necessary, and the commission will go into deliberation. And then the commission will make a motion and vote. So, first of all, um, I will uh, open the public hearing process on 2023 L 003 Maraza Park. At 1501 West 38th Avenue, and that's Becca. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, good morning or good afternoon, Commission. What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to advance the screen. 
There we go. All right, the application and public hearing before you today is the designation of La Raza Park as a local historic district. This designation is being brought forth by Councilwoman Amanda P. Sandoval with the support of Denver Parks and Recreation and Community Planning and Development. Um, so here's a picture of La Raza Park, which we'll get to know intimately uh, through the next few minutes. Uh, and for those of you who are new to the designation process, I'm going to give a brief overview of our designation process and its origins before moving into the application itself. Advancing the slides very slowly. <laughs> All right. So the ability to designate individual landmarks and historic districts in the city and county of Denver is set forth in the 1967 Landmark Preservation Ordinance, which we often call Chapter 30. The purpose of the preservation ordinance is fourfold, to designate, preserve, and protect Denver's historic places, to foster civic pride, to stabilize and improve the aesthetic and economic vitality of the city, and to promote urban, uh, good urban design. Over the past 56 years since the ordinance was adopted by Denver City Council, the city has designated 360 individual landmarks and 58 historic districts scattered across the city. And you can see um, on this map here where they're located. This equals more than 7,000 buildings um, that are designated in the city. And while that sounds like a lot, it's about 4.5% of the city. Um, of our existing uh, designated historic districts, they're primarily residential with only five commercial or downtown districts. And there are also two historic cultural districts significant for their cultural history, um, Five Points and La Alma Lincoln Park. However, when we take a closer look at our designations and the history that is represented in our local landmarks, we realize that our existing local landmarks tell a very narrow history of Denver, uh, one which overrepresents upper class white men. As you can see from this chart, of all the historic designations here in Denver, only 13% of our designation applications represent historically excluded communities. And so here's a little uh, inventory of our landmarks that explicitly reference historically excluded communities in their designation applications, either in the statements of significance or the historic context. Um, now we know that there are Denver landmarks out there that are significant for the connection to groups that are not represented on this list. One good example is West High School. West is technically designated for its early history and architectural style, but it's not designated for its connection to the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 70s, although it was the site of large scale student protests and walkouts associated with that movement. So Landmark staff, City Council, and the community also recognize that you can't designate what you don't know exists. Not only are the historic contributions of historically marginalized communities not represented in our landmarks, they also generally aren't represented in our history books either. Um, so with that in mind, Community Planning and Development uh, a couple of years ago launched a historic context series, Denver in Context, to create historic contexts which are dedicated to some of Denver's underrepresented groups. In 2022, Landmark Preservation and Community Planning and Development published our first historic context um, of Denver's Latino, Chicano, and Mexican-American communities. Entitled Nuestras Historias, this historic context study compiled a number of sites um, identified by these communities as being historically and culturally significant. La Raza Park is one such site identified as having a particular historic and cultural significance to the community. And so shortly after New Stress Historias was published, Councilwoman Sandoval approached CPD and Parks and Rec about making La Raza Park a local landmark, which brings us to today. So the designation application before you is for La Raza Park, um, formerly known as Columbus Park. This is a historic cultural district application. La Raza Park is located in Council District 1 in the Sunnyside neighborhood. The area is zoned OSA, which is open space, and that zoning will not be impacted by the historic designation. 
The designation has the support of Denver Parks and Recreation, and I am joined here today by Principal Planner Stacy West from Denver Parks and Rec. Um, so if you have any parks questions, Stacy will definitely be able to handle those. Um, it's also supported by Community Planning and Development and Councilwoman Sandoval's office. Uh, Councilwoman Sandoval is the applicant for this designation application. The proposed boundary of the historic district is on the screen before you. Uh, it will encompass the entire park, which is located between 38th Avenue and 39th Avenue, Osage and Navajo streets. Um, when prepare, Sorry, trying to get you for it again. <laughs> when preparing this landmark designation, uh, landmark staff looked at other designated parks in Denver to compare how these parks were, were designated. We found that the majority of our designated parks were designated as part of a historic district. Um, in, examples include La Alma Lincoln Park, Curtis Mestizo Park, and Curtis Park. Um, and while some of our historic parks, such as City Park and Wash Park, have small sections designated as an individual landmark, like um, the City Park Pavilion or the Wash Park Boathouse, the park itself is not designated. So you can see on the screen above you, um, these are the historic districts in brown that are mapped, um, and then the red is an individual landmark. Um, so you can see that there are parts that are called out of our old or lowercase h historic parks. Um, but they're not completely designated. So in working with Parks and Rec, uh, Landmark staff opted to designate La Raza Park as a historic district for several reasons. Um, first, this was consistent with how um, most of our parks are, have been designated. Second, the historic district would emphasize the significance as the park as a complete landscape made up of the kiosco, plaza, green spaces, and play spaces within the boundaries of the designation. In Denver, our um, individual landmarks are often very focused on the importance of the building itself, while the surrounding landscape is less integral to the historic or cultural significance. Um, this is not always the case, but generally speaking. Um, but as La Raza's Park historic and cultural significance is intimately tied to its use as a park in all of its forms and functions, Landmark staff felt that a historic district would be a better way to conceptualize the significance of the park. And then finally, for design review purposes, a historic district may allow parks to make changes to the park in a way that does not disrupt the historic character or context of the park while meeting the needs of the current residents and allowing for new uses to be added to the park as necessary. The historic uses of the park have varied during the period of significance, originally providing space for baseball, swings, um, et cetera, before adding a wading pool and then a full-size pool um, in, the late in the 1940s. Now the park sports a small playground and a basketball court in addition to the plaza and kiosco. So the aim of the designation is to allow parks to make changes to the park recreation amenities while still honoring the historic context of the park. Um, our preservation ordinance allows designation applications to be brought forth by the following applications listed on the screen. Uh, this application, as I mentioned, is being brought forth by Councilwoman Sandoval in whose district the park is located. Through conversations with Denver Parks and Rec and Landmark staff, Councilwoman Sandoval requested that Landmark Preservation staff research and write the designation. Generally speaking, staff do not write historic designation applications, but we did so for this historic for this property as it's a city owned property. Um, and it was identified as significant in the historic context. And it was supported by city council, Denver Parks and Recreation and the community. Staff supplemented primary source research, such as looking through newspaper articles, city publications and television reports with interviews from members of the Latino Chicano community who had connections to the park. The council office also hosted two community meetings about the park, one in December 2022, which invited members of the community to share their memories of the park, and a second meeting in March of 2023 um, discussed the draft designation application, the identified significance criteria, and the implications of historic designation for the park. So to qualify as a Denver Historic District, the district must meet the following criteria, it must maintain its integrity, it must be at least 30 years old or have exceptional significance. It must meet three significance criteria and the LPC must consider its historic context. 
So we'll go through all of these um, showing how La Raza Park meets these designation uh, criteria. So we'll begin with the significance criteria. Through historic research, uh, oral history collection, and primary source research, landmark staff found that La Raza Park met four significance criteria shown on the screen. First, uh... <laughs> I know. Great, thank you. Um, first, La Raza Park has a direct association with the historical events and historical development of Denver's North Side from its earliest days as a playground for Denver's thriving Italian community to its time as the, in the heart of the growing Chicano movement in Denver to its current role as a place of celebration and ceremony for a diverse Latino Chicano community that lives in Denver and the surrounding area. In 1906, the city acquired the land of the park uh, and turned it into a playground. The acquisition of dedicated parks and park lands in urban environments was a cornerstone of the urban planning philosophy known as the City Beautiful Movement. The Northside Playground, as it was originally known, was intentionally designed to teach immigrant children American values and social mores as part of the wider pro progressive movement, which influenced the design of cities across America. In 1931, the name of the park was changed to Columbus Park to, to honor the Italian residents who called the Northside home. La Raza Park continue continued to serve as a focal point for the Northside community, even as the surroundings of the area changed, um, with the Latino population steadily growing between 1945 and 1990. In Denver, La Raza Park served as an important location for the nascent Chicano movement to advocate for civil rights causes such as equal access to public amenities, including pools and recreation centers, employment, and education. It was also where the Chicano movement promoted a distinctly Chicano culture by enjoying public space, practicing the arts, religions, and the traditions of La Raza um, in a public space. The community solidified control of La Raza Park in 1970s, but after years of police confrontation and political changes, the pool was infilled in 1984. Uh, in the late 1980s, Denver Parks and Recreation engaged residents to design a new community space for the park, and the Kiosco and the Plaza de La Raza were dedicated on May 5, 1990. La Raza Park became a different kind of gathering space for the Latino community, hosting more large scale um, organized events rather than being an area solely for informal events and gatherings. Ceremonial danza, Dia de los Muertos memorials, and La Raza Park Day all illustrate the contemporary events that connected the community to their culture. The, ev the evolution of La Raza Park from the Northside Playground to the Kiosco and Plaza illustrates the historic development of the um, North Side neighborhood, its residents, and a century of cultural development in Denver. La Raza Park also is directly associated with specific historic events, including a 1981 police attack that saw police firing tear gas and releasing police dogs into crowded, a crowd of families, many with small children. Um, and this traumatic event still impacts the community to this day. Other events, such as the dedication of the kiosco, the renaming of the park and its rededication are all specific events that illustrate the significance of La Raza Park throughout its history. La Raza Park also meets criterion F, as it represents an established and familiar feature of the Sunnyside neighborhood, the community and the contemporary city due to its prominent location and physical characteristics. The park, which occupies a full city block between Osage and Navajo Street and West 38th Avenue, is an established and familiar feature of the Sunnyside and Highlands neighborhood. It's the second largest park in the Sunnyside neighborhood, and the, pre pre <laughs> the prominent kiosco is visible from 38th Avenue, which is a major thoroughfare of North Denver. This is the only kiosco in the city of Denver, and its unique physical characteristic and cultural importance make it an established and familiar feature in the neighborhood. La Raza Park is also a physical attribute of, an, of the Northside neighborhood and Denver's Latino Chicano community that serves as a source of pride and cultural understanding. 
The park was often the site of Chicano movement actions, including the 1969-1970 takeover or liberation of the park. By hiring local community members and activists to staff the pool, the community created a safe space for children, young adults, and elders. The role La Raza played as a liberated area under community control is still a source of pride for the community um, today, as it was in the 1970s. La Raza's continued role as a space for cultural events, such as the yearly summer solstice festival, the La Raza Park Day, and Dia de los Muertos, allows the Chicano Latino community to connect to their culture and invites the wider Denver community to understand Chicano Latino cultural practices. The renaming of the park in 2020 serves as a point of pride for the Latino Chicano community, and it has been colloquially known as the Rodica Park for 50 plus years before its official renaming. Renewing, removing the name of Columbus, a man associated with colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples in the Americas, from the park represents a reclaiming of the land by indigenous voices. The kiosco, murals, and sculpture in the park all celebrate indigenous arts and culture and is a source of pride for the community. And then finally, La Paraza Park is associated with Chicano Movement, a civil rights movement of the 1960s that contributed significantly to the culture of Denver's North Side, in addition to Colorado and the nation of the whole. The Chicano movement embraced the encouraged the embrace of a distinctly Chicano identity in opposition to the ideal of assimilation into a wider American culture. While the Chicano movement had distinctive historic events, um, as discussed in Criterion A, it also had a tremendous influence on the culture of Denver's North Side. La Raza Park served as a site of direct action through marches and protests, but also served as an incubator for Chicano and Lat Latino culture. And um, as an asterisk, we we're defining culture um, it, as the landmark ordinance does as being the traditions, beliefs, customs, practices of a particular community. La Raza Park is also home to early murals by local Chicano artists that represent Chicano culture as a unique artistic practice, a visual retelling of important cultural beliefs and traditions, and a visual claiming of the park. This practice was continued by murals David Garcia, who designed and painted um, the, the journey within the Cook kiosco in 2016. The park also serves as a center for many cultural events, um, as we've discussed. And this has all culminated in the renaming of La Raza Park in 2020. And then in 2021, the dedication of the park with the installation of Emmanuel Martinez's La Raza Unidad sculpture. So a period of significance, some of you may have noticed <laughs> that we have a very long period of significance, which is pretty unusual. Um, so let's dive into that. Uh, the proposed period of significance for La Raza Park is prior to and including uh, 2021. This period of significance recognizes the historical significance of the land as undeveloped land before its platting in 1871. The period of significance also captures the historic and cultural significance of La Raza Park and its representation of development patterns in Denver through 1993. And typically 1993 would be our 30 year cutoff. Um, so it's very unusual that this is a long period of significance uh, and that it encompasses a period of less than 30 years. Um, however, local and national events between 2013 and 2021 had great influence on the park and justify an expanded exceptional period of significance. So generally, uh, preservationists require a property to be of a certain age before it is eligible for designation. In Denver, local landmarks should generally be 30 years of age before they are designated. This allows historians and preservation professionals the benefit of hindsight and the ability to evaluate if something is indeed significant. However, some resources or events are so immediately recognized and documented as significant that they are considered to have exceptional significance and thus may be eligible for designation even when they achieve, achieved significance more recently. In the case of the Raza Park, while the resource is more than 30 years of age, the period of significance extends into 2021 due to its exceptional importance. For 50 years, community leaders and activists advocated for the name of the park to be officially changed to La Raza Park. 
uh, while the community refers to it as La Raza Park rather than Columbus Park and regularly spray painted the signs to remove the name Columbus, the city and county of Denver did not acknowledge this change. Um, indeed, a 1988 attempt to officially rename the park failed at city council. However, in the summer of 2020, a uh, councilwoman Amanda Sandoval, who represents the district where La Raza is located, initiated the official renaming of the park to La Raza Park. And this official renaming process must be placed in the political context of the late um, 2010s. In 2013, the Black Lives Matter movement formed following the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the shooting death of an innocent Black teenager, Trayvon Martin. As the movement grow, grew, Americans were confronted with the systematic racism and white supremacy that had formed the basis of the country. Memorials and monuments to Confederacy were moved throughout, removed throughout the South. The conversation about Confederate monuments soon grew to encompass monuments to Christopher Columbus. Columbus, an explorer who was once credited, credited with discovering the Americas, has in more recent scholarship come to represent the genocide of indigenous Americans through Central America and the Caribbean and the plunder of American resources by European countries. Many indigenous groups and allies protest the mon monuments to Columbus on this basis, and these objections gained traction during the wider conversations and policy changes happening in the late 2010s. By 2020, the protests against systematic racism in the country were common and growing, sparked by the murder of an unarmed black man, George Floyd, by a mini Minneapolis police on May 25th, 2020, scholars have noted that these protests represent the largest sustained protests in American history. Indeed, one scholar um, described the murder of George Floyd as a watershed moment for the movement against systematic racism in the United States. In Denver, protests were reflected of, of both national and local concerns. Uh, protesters across the metro area gathered in Aurora to march in honor of Elijah McClain, a 23-year-old Black man who was murdered by Aurora police and paramedics in 2019. Community members also led the charge to rename a Denver neighborhood of Stapleton to Central Park, removing its association with former Denver Mayor Benjamin Stapleton, who was a prominent member of the Ku Klux Klan. And so in the midst of these ongoing conversations that were literally reshaping the city, Councilwoman Sandoval and the Latino Chicano members of the Northside community renewed their call to rename Columbus Park. Tapping into conversations and precedents set in the South during 2015, they argued that Columbus was not a historical figure to be celebrated or commemorated. Instead, the name, naming the park La Raza would better, better represent the history of the park and the Chicano Latino community who live there now. We do want to note that there was still some sentiment amongst the Italian American community of Denver um, that this name was erasing the history of from the earlier Italian community of the North Side. Uh, this disagreement was acknowledged by the or organizers of the renaming, but they still felt it was appropriate to remove the name of Columbus from the park and hoped that La Raza could come to represent the entire community. In December 2020, the name of the park was officially changed to La Raza Park. However, it was not until Jan uh, June 2021 the park was rededicated with a community celebration. It was at this rededication that a sculpture, the Raza Unidad, by notable Chicano artist and activist Emmanuel Martinez was installed. Given the importance of the Chicano Latino community to the park and its historical and cultural significance, staff believes that it's appropriate to end the period of significance with the community celebration that renamed the park. So chapter 30 also requires that a landmark designated property maintains its integrity as defined as the ability to, of a structure or district to convey its historic, geographic, architectural, or cultural significance, recognized as belonging to its particular time and place in Denver's history. This proposed district uh, actually retains a high degree of integrity when you consider this period of significance. Although the site has seen changes throughout its life, it still maintains its ability to convey its historic, geographic, and cultural significance. It maintains its, location, its integrity of location and setting as an urban park in a primarily residential neighborhood. 
It maintains integrity of materials, design, and workmanship as it uses landscaping and concrete to delineate space, encourage recreation, and allow for easy updating and maintenance. The park maintains uh, integrity of feeling and association as it remains a gathering space for the surrounding neighborhood who utilize it for recreation. And then finally, it, rem it remains a central gathering space for the wider Latino Chicano community who lived in the area and who returned to celebrate cultural events. And so while the pool has been infilled, the kiosco serves as a contemporary gathering space in its stead. And then finally, the LPC must consider the park's historic context. So the Raza Park relates to several historic contexts and trends. First, the purchase and creation of a public park in North Denver is closely tied to the City Beautiful movement and the progressive movements that shaped Denver and cities across the nation in the early 20th century. The liberation of the park in the 1970s illustrates the active civil rights movement and particular the Chicano movement, which had a great impact on the nation's political and social fabric. Finally, La Raza Park's officially renaming um, in 2020 relates to the present day national reckoning with the his nation's history and how public monuments and properties shape our understanding of history. The physical changes to the park from its origins as open landscape to becoming the first municipally owned playground in Denver to a pool and its later more formal and ceremonial contemporary form illustrates the development patterns of the city of Denver and parks planning and philosophy. And of course, in addition to honoring important places that illustrate Denver's history, local designation does come with design review. A landmark preservation staff will review all site work at La Raza Park that requires a building or zoning permit. However, the designation application has laid out a list of contributing and non-contributing fe features within the park to help guide thoughtful, sensitive change to the park, while, which is still going to be an active neighborhood park. Given the accumulation of changes that have occurred in the park during the course of its life, it seems that the physical structures of the playground or the locations of the sidewalks are less important than the, um, it is to preserve the use of the park as a park, as an active and recreation space for the neighborhood. Uh, Landmark staff also worked closely with the Chicano Murals Project of Colorado to lay out a preservation recommendation and plan for the protection of the murals located within the kiosco structure. So for public comments, as of 5 p.m. Um, Friday, April 21st, uh, CPD had received 10 public comments in support of the historic designation. And by 12 p.m. Monday, um, May 1st, we had received an additional five public comments in support of the designation, bringing the total to 15 public comments in support. So now, now the exciting part for you guys. <laughs> um, based on the criteria laid out in chapter 30 of the revised municipal code, landmark preservation staff recommends that the commission approves this designation application for La Raza Park and forwards it to city council. Becca, thank you very much. <laughs> that was really interesting. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for staff? I have a, maybe a trivial question. Um, is the actual boundary the center line of the street or the district? It is the center line of the streets because that's how we do historic districts. If it had been an individual landmark, it would have gone by the right of way, I think, which would have left out a whole section of the park. Does that require clarification on the, because there was a legal description that referred to lots? I don't believe so, but I'll double check with um, the attorneys. Um, just a, of interest, 40 or 50 years from now, because we've gone through this process, the name could not be changed again? I think it potentially could be because the renaming process is separate from the landmark process. And I think it's housed with parks. Yeah, I think that would certainly go through a similar community process mm -hmm. and through city council to determine if a name change was warranted based on new or different historic events. Mm -hmm. And for clarity, we have renamed some other historic districts as well. Um, Five Point 
it's it's well into the well commercial corridor and, and it was renamed the five minutes of historic mm-hmm. cultural district. So that is not an unheard of mm-hmm. for us as well. Yeah, and you have a question. Um it's about the structures that are mm-hmm. part of So and I think you answered it. So they're not they're not exactly contributing features. Is that correct? So the two contributing features are the kiosco and the plaza, and then the existing um, play structure is non-contributing. So if the community decided that they wanted to put in another structure within the park, that, that it would just, what is the name of that process? Good question. So I, it would go through design review with us, but I also believe it would go through a design review process with parks. Yeah, we would do, and this is probably going to come up in the next several years based on the age of the play equipment, where we would go through our typical parks planning process with the community to determine, you know, what what's the recreation use now, um, what's the age of the equipment and what needs to be replaced. And if there was a proposal for a new type of structure to go in there, um, we would work with the community on what that is. And then um, if it was something that um, met the standards for landmark review, we would um, work with our colleagues here and bring it before you all. Um, I guess what I'm sort of asking, because I haven't had, is it considered infill? Is something you can see? I mean, in terms of how it would come back to- I don't think it would go through a two-step process. <laughs> um, Okay, I just was sort of curious about mm-hmm. whether the. Okay, I have another question. Is there a design advisory group for the park like like there is or was for like the uh, city park? No, a, there was a design advisory group for city mm-hmm. park, which either disbanded or uh, was dormant, but I'm wondering because of the neighborhood interest is there a, a permanent or semi-permanent structure that would allow for the continuation of the neighborhood down that would collect the parks and that is planning for considering that sure so we don't have a standing one um, particularly for our small parks um, but when we go through our park planning process we typically do put together a steering committee depending on the scale of work to be done um, and that pulls mainly from community members. Um, we would also pull in experts as needed. So I could see for this one, for example, someone who had knowledge of the structure of the kiosk or the murals to be preserved, who would also serve on that committee to help inform what treatments went into the planning process or went into the final design. Anything else? Questions? Okay. Great. Yeah, and I think we might have Melissa serving as the applicant. So, hi, Melissa. Hi. Okay. Come have a seat. Um, you've got seven minutes to talk about the application. And um, please begin with your name and address on our seat. Absolutely. My name is Melissa Horn. I am the aide to Councilwoman Sandoval. Uh, she has asked me to step in on her behalf because she is at committee right now. Um, She's very disappointed that she couldn't be here to speak on behalf of this important first of its kind designation. Um, Unfortunately, she is in uh, the Finance and Government Committee, uh, Governance Committee, um, because she is the City Council appointed uh, board member for the Denver Preschool Program and the sponsor of a Denver Preschool Program ballot referral measure that is being heard in committee today. Uh, Due to this unavoidable conflict, Councilwoman Sandoval has asked me to share her thoughts with you. Uh, Councilwoman Sandoval strongly supports historic designations and believes this application for La Raza Park is a way to preserve and protect the park. The park has been an influential, uh, or played an influential role in her personal life and was also a pivotal location during the Chicano movement. It should be noted that the term La Raza means the people. So this park is the people's park. Following the renaming of Columbus Park to La Raza Park in December 2020, the community expressed a strong desire to officially recognize the significance of La Raza Park throughout Denver's history. This designation application, much like the park renaming, is being presented 
on behalf of the community and has the support from community in Northwest Denver and throughout the greater Denver region. Notably, this application has garnered the support of a wave of new residents wanting to acknowledge and respect the history of the neighborhood that they now call home. This has helped bridge the divide between longtime residents and recent arrivals. The historic designation of La Raza Park helps tell the story of seven generations <clears throat> oops, sorry, uh, of people and for those generations and for those seven generations who will come after that. It also recognizes the need to look beyond traditional media sources when seeking to document the, the historical connections and events for Chicanos and other people of color. Finally, the council would like to acknowledge and thank those that have played a significant role in bringing this application forward. First, she would like to thank the mayor. Mayor Hancock uh, recognized the importance of preserving La Raza Park. His support was instrumental in ensuring the cooperation and collaboration of both Denver Parks and Recreation and Landmark staff. The councilwoman would like to thank Happy Haynes and Stacy West from Denver Parks and Recreation. Stacy West played a significant, or spent a significant amount of time researching La Raza Park and the events associated with it for this application. Lastly, the councilwoman would like to thank Becca Deershaw with Landmark for interviewing countless community members and writing this groundbreaking application. We are grateful for her expertise and partnership during this process. And that's all I have. Your name I'm sorry. I am Melissa Horn. Uh, I, I reside at 2900 Rob Circle in Lakewood. Fantastic. She's going to be able to come in and out. She's sneaking out of committee That's for this. Great, you've got six minutes and 53 seconds. Love Fantastic. <laughs> if you don't mind sharing. Councilwoman. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much um, for your dedication to the landmark process and for your service to um, such important issues facing Denver when it comes to landmark preservation. I know you all are a volunteer board, so I greatly appreciate your service. Um, I think everything was covered fully. fully. Um, what was left out and what I heard was my community. And I am only doing this on behalf of the community and for the community. And this was the community's idea who brought the name change of the park to me during COVID in the time when um, people couldn't meet and we had to be creative on how to get the signatures and how to get this through virtually. And once again, um, last year for Dia de los Muertos, we have a huge Dia de los Muertos celebration of this park. They brought forward this idea out of the cultural historic context study. So it would, I cannot finish this with without saying thank you to my community because it is my community that I'm here today um, and have the honor of representing Northwest Denver where I was born and raised in this community. And so reflective representation matters. I'm bringing forward this um, story of the Chicano movement um, that often goes untold without, without as much specificity that Becca was able to provide today. So I hope that you um, give this full consideration and I hope that we, uh, we can get your support to move this application move forward to all of city council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilwoman, uh, we need your name and address for our records, please. Yep, it's Councilwoman Amanda Sandoval, 1810 Platte Street, Denver, Colorado. Thank you. Very much. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for the app? I, I have a question uh, about uh, you mentioned you know how important this is to the community. Is is the demographics of the neighborhood changing in a way that kind of threatens that? It is, but as I mentioned, I, we I can answer. Um, so it doesn't threaten it. No, that's not an accurate assessment of what's happening in Northwest Denver. Actually. Um, the park name changing brought people together. There is a renaissance of people wanting to learn about um, the neighborhoods that they move into. And so although when I was growing up there, the demographics was 80% Latino and now it's about 23%, there's still a lot of people who um, live in the neighborhood born and raised, such as myself, who have been bringing forward these narratives of uh, social unrest and the change that has happened and some of the um, 
things that they experienced. And so actually, although the demographics have changed, these processes have brought my community together even more. Commissioners, any other questions for the applicants? No? Okay. Applicants, thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, then we will move into the public uh, comment portion. Um, to the in-person or it's up to you, but I would recommend sticking with in-person or virtual. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Let's see, how about we go with uh, people that are in, uh, that are here in person. We'll start with anyone uh, in, from the public that's here in person. And then uh, don't worry if you're joining us virtually, uh, as soon as everyone uh, that's here per in person has spoken, we'll come to you um, and make sure that all of you who are joining us virtually have a chance to um, to comment as well. So, um, Okay, great. Um, so public comments for public hearing, just so you all know, if you are joining by phone, dial nine on your phone keypad to raise your hand or email landmark at denver.gov.org with the name, phone number. And um, if you're joining via computer, please click the hand raise functions. So you will all have three minutes to provide your comments. And if you could, during that three minutes, give uh, your name and address for our records, please. Um, so you can come up and speak. Here. First person. Yeah. Um, please clearly state if you're in favor or opposition. Absolutely. My name is Tommy Ray. Tommy Ray said I grew up in Northwest Denver in the Jewish community. My address is 9260 Raleigh Street, Westminster, Colorado. I'm on the Denver Latino Commission. It's a mayor appointee position, and we support and endorse this uh, landmark with Alaska Park. And commissioners appreciate your support and help and also the the panel so if you can get this to become a landmark it'd be outstanding as the councilman and the spoke people has spoken on it is has been a very significant landmark at the community and the study has been greatly appreciated by the the, the community itself and they're really excited that, that this is going to be hopefully be a landmark of the city of denver and make it great but thank you i appreciate that thank you welcome So we have one public comment from Dennis McPherson. So we will come to the virtual um, public. Uh, if you are interested in joining us, there's a hand raised. Unmute through your camera on now if you like. Would you like to unmute? If you'd like to make a nope. comment, there you are. Hi. Hi. If you uh, could give us your name and your address, and you have three minutes to make your comment. Uh, yes, I think you're speaking to me. My name is Florence Navarro, and I am a longtime resident of North Denver. I reside at 2728. West 39th Avenue and have lived here in North Denver, um, as I mentioned, my whole life and my follow in the footsteps of both my parents. So we are definitely longtime residents and grew up um, uh, participating and attending all the different community events that brought us together there at La Raza Park. So I am asking for your support in the designation and preservation of this park for future uh, family and community uh, to be able to enjoy and come together in. So again, asking for your support in the designation of La Raza Park. And um, as it means more than just a park, as the presentation, as Becca went forward in the presentation, it is a place of tradition and hopefully we, that's the critical part is to carry our traditions forward and introduce all our traditions to our children and their children. So again, thank you for your consideration. And um, just to let you know, I am a member of the 
uh, Denver Parks and Rec Advisory Board and have seen these pop processes through with the renaming and even back in uh, a few years ago. So again, just asking for your support in the designation have been uh, involved and uh, would like to see this forwarded as this park means a lot, not to just me individually, but friends who all grew up around the park, working at the park and the pool, um, and again, for our future and for the children and uh, our neighbors, our community. So again, thank you so much and appreciate your time. And again, your service to the, the commission as well. Thank you. Thank you. Taylor, do we have more hands raised? I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Is there anyone else out there in the public that would like to make a comment? Raise your hand down. Doesn't look like it. Okay, then we will close the public hearing officially. We need to go into deliberation. Commissioners, what do you think? Remember the guidelines. It has integrity. It has the uh, the applicant states it includes four criteria. No, I I think if you if, if integrity is an issue, if you're dealing with a park space and it's the integrity of the community, and there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the community is integral with the park and vice versa, the, the events there, the celebrations there, it, it to me absolutely meets the requirements for integrity and stage. And I love the fiasco. Yes, <laughs> Thank you, George. Yeah. I support the application as well uh, for all the reasons stated in the application. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. I thought the application was beautifully put together. It was so, um, detailed and so interesting to find out about that community. And um, I think um, that could clearly show that it meets the guidelines. And um, it's particularly nice that the community is in favor of it. So I support this application. Yeah, I also thought it was fun to me. It's a good reunion. Yeah. Very good. I agree. Um, I think it was a well prepared um, application. And I think it meets all the criteria, including the Exceptional significance that would uh, take it up to uh, point to paper. All right, then. Do I hear a motion? I can make the motion. Sure, that would be great. Uh, Thank you. Or actually, maybe you want to make the motion? Here it is. Your first motion? Sure. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I move to recommend approval and forward to City Council the landmark designation of the Rosa Park application number 2023L 003 based on the landmark ordinance criteria A, F, I, and J, citing as findings of fact for this recommendation the application form, public testimony, and the April 25th, 2023 staff. Do I hear a second? Second. George has seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Unanimously, we have approved um, the application to be forwarded to the city council. Thank you, staff. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are moving on now to design and review projects. And our first one is 2023-COA-143 at 143 Delaware Street in the Baker neighborhood. And it's Crystal. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's go over very briefly the design review process. Uh, the chair, I will announce the design review items on the agenda by an address. Commission members will announce any uh, conflicts of interest that they might have. The staff will uh, introduce the application and recommendation, and commissioners can question the staff. Um, the applicant uh, presentation is limited to 10 minutes, and the commissioners may have questions for the applicants. Uh, public comment uh, is unlike the public hearing. These public comments would be two minutes per person. And if you are here in person, we'll um, 
will be right here to see you if you are interested. Um, if you are virtual, we will look for your hand raise button if you'd like to speak. Um, and you're not a part of that applicant team, please use a hand raise button on your screen. And for those calling via phone, dial nine to raise your hand or email landmark at Denver. <laughs> at which point, <laughs> staff, after the applicant's presentation, the staff will have a chance to clarify if they wish, and then commissioners will go into deliberation. So, Crystal, without further ado. Thanks. Okay, so this application is proposing to construct a new tandem house single family residence on an existing corner lot with a primary structure at 143 Delaware Street in the Baker Neighborhood Historic District. The new tandem house will be located at the rear of the zone lot and face onto West 2nd Avenue with access to the rear um, with a one car attached garage. Uh, from the adjacent alley. On the left, you can see the vacant part of the lot for the new house. So at the top left of the screen is the block plan comparison for the new house in context with surrounding structures. The house will be set back from the street and, and is within normal setback patterns for the block. At the bottom left is the streetscape comparison. The existing primary structure stands at 17 feet, six inches, and the adjacent commercial structure across the rear alley stands at 20 feet, 11 inches. The new proposed modern Italian eight style home will be 22 feet tall and is of a height consistent with other houses on this block and in the historic district. And then finally on the right is the compatibility demonstration showing other Italianate style structures found in the district, mainly on Alati Street, and they were all likely originally commercial structures. Uh, these buildings range in height from 21 feet to 22 feet in height, uh, matching the height of the new proposed house. 117, 121, and 123 Alati Street are all contributing to the district, uh, though 134 Alati Street is not. Next slide. Oh, it hasn't been working, but we'll try. There she goes. Okay. So here's the front and west elevation facing the alley of the proposed modern Italian eight tandem house. The building form and massing is characteristic of the district and fits in with adjacent Italian eight and commercial structures found on Alati Street just across the alleyway. The proposed structure will be constructed at a typical grade like other structures on the block and does utilize floor to floor heights that appear similar to those in the surrounding context. The facade reflects typical historic proportions and uses horizontal articulation with a simple parapet at the roof line and lintels and sills at the windows. The house incorporates a one story front porch and individual impaired windows at mostly similar proportions to other homes found within the district. And then here are the side and rear elevations of the structure, which also show the proposed flat roof form, like other Italianate structures found in the district. And at the east elevation are French doors to a side yard. Some atypical windows are proposed at these less visible rear and side elevations of the structure. And so finally, these are some perspective views of the proposed structure. The proposed infill structure's overall mass, width, and form is characteristic of the district and matches historic proportions. Therefore, staff is recommending approval of the phase one application. Additionally, the applicant is requesting an administrative adjustment for bulk plane violation at the front of the new house, um, which staff is supportive of. That's it. Great. Crystal, thank you very much. Commissioners, do you have any questions for staff? I have a question, just sort of a technical question, because it's a corner lot. Mm -hmm. What is the address of the tandem house? Um, I'm not sure if it has an address yet. I'll have to look on the zone lot. Um, no, the question I'm asking is usually a tandem house. The front of the house is 180 degrees from the front of the primary structure. In this case, it's actually 90 degrees or 270. Right. And, um, that seems sort of unusual in a tandem house. And I understand it's an unusual situation, but can you talk about that a little bit? Um, well, from what I've seen in Baker, there are other houses that face the side block. So for us, like it didn't seem unusual because um, there are sometimes 
lots that are both on the numbered streets and on the named streets. Um, but in this case, uh, the cell is both on one lot, so it didn't seem unusual. And, and the zoning code does support the tandem houses when they're on corner lots addressing the street. It's not required, but it does. It okay, thank you. Any other questions for this one? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, is our applicant here? No. Um, is the applicant uh, virtual and would like to join us? If you're the applicant and you would like to join us, please raise your hand. Okay. Are you there? Yes. Uh, am I there? Yes, you are. Oh, okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah. uh, my name is Dean Ritchie. And uh, address is 5180 Vallejo Street. Perfect, thank you. Yep. And, and to answer your first question, as we have been to addressing already, the address of this um, house will be 40, uh, 430 West 2nd. So it is addressed on 2nd Ave rather than um, Delaware. Um, the, as you know, this is kind of an interesting sort of site, and, and we, we kind of bounced around a little bit before we landed here. And I think because when you look at that streetscape, there's a very small one-story house, and then our site, and then a much larger commercial building that sort of anchors the edge of this um, commercial district. Typically, when we do these tandems, we sort of reference the existing single-family house. And um, I, it's made a lot of sense in the past. And, and we started there. We, we actually first went to staff with a kind of simplified Queen Anne. But and we got to a point where pro probably everyone thought it was OK. Uh, but we had really a, a difficult scale issue between a very small house and then a, a larger new house that references the old house. But because it's a corner lot, it, it, it seemed to sort of overwhelm that. And then the much larger um commercial structure that sort of had nothing to do with either one so we, we we went back and we looked at going referencing more the the commercial building we actually went to staff with something in between that was more of a storefront and they didn't really like the false sense of history that that presented so that's how we landed on this italianate form i, I think it is um a, a form that's very common for residential structures in the district but the mass allows us to sort of better navigate that transition from the much larger commercial to the single story um, residential on, you know, on the other side, at the front of the site. So it wasn't a particularly straight line getting here, but that's how we landed on this. Um, and as Crystal said, again, we, you know, want to make sure you're comfortable with uh, requesting an AA on a bold claim violation. It is just on the side street. There isn't anything on the side interior but um, just want to make sure that that makes sense to you. A, a lot of that has to do with the form. A lot of it has to do with the zoning requirements on that rear 35. Um, so uh, that's really what I've got. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for our applicant? Oh, it doesn't look like any, no question. All right, sir, thank you very much for joining us. Um, are there any comments from the public? Do we have any hands raised? If you'd like to join us over here, if anyone has a comment, um, please raise your hand. Your hands raised. Thanks, Taylor. There are no hands raised, so we're going to go ahead and go into deliberation, commissioners. Um, opinions, thoughts? Well, I can start. I have to say that I was surprised when I went to Street View to see what the um, primary house look like um, because it's not really reflected in the documents, but I understand that tandem houses are not ADUs. It's a different, um, it's a different process. And um, the app, the guideline 4.3 says design a building to include typical features and ryth rhythms of historic buildings in the surrounding, not necessarily the primary structure. So I thought this was actually a very interesting and successful um, application of sort of the tenants of a tandem house as opposed to an ADU. And I support the staff's um, 
the staff report. I, I think that this does a good job of meeting guidelines for a tandem house. Thank you, Anne. Other comments? I agree. Very agrees. I agree. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think given the context that um, uh, paying reference to the buildings that front Second Avenue across the alley is maybe a more successful approach to a tandem house than trying to um, pay reference to the house on the corner in this given circumstance. Okay, great. Thank you. George? And that is <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I agree. I think it's a good bridge between uh, the residential and the commercial. Piece. So, very creative. Well, All righty. Without further ado, does anyone want to present the motion? George, uh, come Madam Chair, I move to approve application 2023 COA 143 for mass form and context of the proposed infrastructure at 143 Delaware Street. Per presented testimony, submitted documentation, guidelines 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.7, and 4.8 in the Baker neighborhood character defining features, presented testimony, and submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report. I also move to recommend an administrative adjustment for the bulk claim per section 12.4.5.3 of the Denver Zoning Code. Finding that conformance to the requirements of the zoning code would have an adverse impact upon the structure and surrounding district. George, thank you. Second. And Gary has seconded it. Uh, let's take a vote then. All in favor, aye. 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 Uh, opposed, nay. Uh, we have approved it unanimously. Um, well done. All right. Uh, moving on to our next design review project is 2023 COA 141. At 1446-1448 Stewart Street, a Spangler House. Sorry, it's Brittany. Oh, Brittany. Really? I'm okay. just going to sit here. So our next application is for phase two design detail submittal for a new in infill duplex structure adjacent to the A Spangler House, which is an individual Denver landmark in um, the West Colfax neighborhood. Here you can see the proposed site plan. So the new duplex structure will have a single, singular uh, walkway up to the front porch that allows access into the two units. The, um, the uh, one unit's entrance is camouflaged on the south elevation um, and one unit is facing the street, uh, giving the appearance of a um, single family residence similar to the A Spangler house. The footprint of the structure is very similar to the A Spangler house. Um, there will be new patios at the rear and a new concrete uh, curb cut for the garage structure at the rear, but mostly softscaping in the front yard. There will be a new fence um, in the front yard. In the rear, it will be a privacy fence. And in the front yard, it will be a lower and height um, fence. However, staff have some concerns um, as the fence in the front yard is not shown as 50% open. So we are recommending that be altered to at least 50% open forward of the primary facade. Um, not much has changed for the primary structure in terms of the floor plans. However, in the phase one mass form and context um, submittal, the commission did look at a lofted space above the garage. Um, the applicant is no longer proposing that lofted space. So the garage has been reduced in scale to just a um, single uh, parking um, structure floor with no lofted space above. So I did want to point that out to the commission um, in regards to that. <clears throat> Here is the proposed infill structure. Um, the proposed infill structure will be clad in brick and lap siding um, with some spandrel panels located around the doors. The cladding material really accents the building massing. So on the um, north side of the site, the tower massing is clad in a black brick. And then the um, front facade of the um, of 1446 is clad in a um, lap siding material. Um, and then that massing then um, transitions to the side with the lap siding. And then the building massing has another shift in massing that is uh, brick cladding again. So the cladding material is really accenting the um, massing of the structure 
similar to the egg bangler house in the way that the cladding materials for that structure are used to accent um, the building floors and the building masking as well. It is a simple combination of materials. So it is a black brick and a fiber cement lap siding and fiber cement panel um, that you're seeing on the structure. Um, the structure does transition to the rear facades um, to be that same lap siding material that you see on the front facade. I do wanna point out to the commission that um, this structure does have a raised foundation, um, but on the front facade, uh, the brick will go all the way down to the um, ground floor level, or sorry, the foundation level. Um, so that, that concrete foundation on the front facade will be clad in brick. And then behind the privacy fence, it'll just transition into that concrete material, but it does have a raised foundation. Um, here you can see the secondary elevation of the garage. That structure is also clad in lap siding, and both the primary structure and garage structure have a horizontal C-channel detail that provides some horizontal banding and detailing to um, the building facades. Um, so the horizontal lines that you're seeing on the structure are actually a still C-channel detail. Uh, this is the rear elevation. Um, these are sliding glass doors. However, they're not visible from the public right away um, that do allow access onto that patio space and um, upper story deck that you're seeing. Again, this facade is um, just clad in that lap siding with that C-channel detail. And then this is the uh, north elevation. So again, the cladding material does um, reflect the building massing. So the tower massing is clad in brick that wraps the corner. And then it does transition into that lap siding material um, with that C channel uh, wrapping the building facade as well. Um, here are the garage elevations. Uh, the garage door is a simple roll up door. Um, it will have a light um, that you can see here in this elevation. That is black um, glazed glass. Typically we do require glazing to be clear. Um, however, this is on a secondary structure and faces the alley. Um, so we have allowed additional flexibility for um, frosted glazing in the past on secondary facades in private spaces. Um, so while this is not something we typically see, staff were comfortable with this uh, black glazing used on the garage. Um, as this is just a service area and it is facing onto the alley and it does not have an impact to the surrounding context um, as there, this is not a historic district, but an individual landmark site. Um, here are some of the wall section and details. Um, so in the brick clad portion of the building, uh, the windows will be inset into the wall plane. However, on the a lap, clad portion of the building, windows are not inset into the wall plane. So staff are requesting that the windows be inset at least um, two inches into the wall plane, and that can be measured from the glazing. Um, this is a standard brick, as you can see in um, this detail. And then at the front porch, there are some steel accent details used on the building to relate to the steel C-channel that you see. So the front porch will have a um, steel uh, kind of flange underneath it, and then it'll transition into a vented um, fiber cement uh, soffit siding. So um, here you can see that detail a little bit better and closer up, and then a standard um, brick concrete foundation for the porch. Uh, the porch on the um, side facing the Spangler house does have a, a steel screen on it um, just kind of provides some additional privacy to that porch, but um, staff were not concerned about that detail. Um, and here you can kind of see the, um, the detailing for that steel channel that is providing horizontal banding for the structure. Um, additionally, I want to point out that this structure is intended to have a deeply raked mortar joint um, to provide some detailing to the brick facade. Uh, so it will have a lot of horizontal articulation to the building facade, um, allowing the massing to be broken down and read more horizontal on this building that is uh, slightly taller. So here are those um, materials, again, just the black brick. Um, a lot of the materials are going to be black um, with a gray um, matter trim. All the windows are a fiberglass composite, um, also in the black finish. 
um, and then uh, uh, gray accent details uh, for the trim and the concrete. So in terms of um, this application, staff are recommending approval as we feel that the material cladding is high quality, it's reflective of the building massing, it's simple in nature, and is also similar to the material cladding of the Ace Spangler house, where you see a mix of masonry materials with wood materials used. Um, while it is a black color, the Ace Spangler house, as you can see in this photo, has also been uh, repainted to be a black color as well, except for the stone foundation. Um, so staff just have some renderings to show you. Um, we feel that this uh, project proposal is compatible and meets the landmark design guidelines. Um, and we just feel that the uh, renderings kind of show the material articulation a little bit better and how they're articulating that building massing. Um, so I just have a few of those and then we'll just end on the garage here. So recommending conditional approval um, with minor conditions regarding the fencing and uh, the inset of the windows on the left siding uh, portion of the building. Okay, Brittany, thank you. Um, commissioners, any questions for Brittany? Oh, great. Um, Taylor, do we have our applicant? Rare to go? No. Applicants, if you would raise your hands and provide you. Ryan, right? It should be, yeah. I mean, if he's not here, I don't hear Matthew Ryan. If you're here, can you please raise your hand? We would just move forward. All right. All right. So the applicant is not with us. So, um, I, unless you all have any other questions for staff, we'll go ahead and go into deliberation. Um, public oh, first. public comment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just looking at the word in the hands. Right? So, um, if there's anyone out there for, that would like to provide a public comment, please raise your hand so that we can come to you. Doesn't look like it. No, no. Okay, Taylor. All right, then, um, commissioners, let's go into deliberation. Um, Thoughts, comments? Well, if the applicant was here, I wanted to compliment them on how far this project has come because I think this is the third time we've seen it. Yeah. And um, it just is, you know, in the beginning, it was hard to know how anybody was going to do a project next to the Spangler House. Yeah. And I think that they had, that the applicants found a very effective way of doing infill construction. And holding their own without trying to compete, which is sort of what happened in the beginning. So I think um, I support the staff's recommendation. I think it's that it's really done a great job um, of meeting the guidelines. The only thing that's a little bit odd about it is on this block, there's sort of two stars. And then when you look at what's next to it, you sort of feel a little bit badly for the house. You know, the house is sort of on the left and the right because there are clearly two stars on this house, which is not, you know, that's irrelevant, it does not have anything to do with the guidelines. But I have to say, I think this project does a good job. And um, I commend the applicant if they were here on how well they follow through. And thank you, Gary. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Nick? Uh, I agree as well. I, I, I would commend them on the, the details around the doors and the windows and the horizontal datum that runs around the house, all of that level of detail to what is such a simple volume really helps it uh, pair up nicely with the historic home next to it. Yeah. So that yeah. claims what Anne said. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. George? Well, I, I always find black houses a little questionable <laughs> but summer is hot here the uh the way the color scheme flows with the spangler house mm -hmm. and <laughs> it was there first <laughs> and even though it's it's been repainted i think it's a it's just enough of a good fit and just enough of a modern adaptation so i would have no problem supporting it george thank you you want to hear a motion 
I can do the motion. Thank you, Ann. Unless of the no, no, okay. please. Madam Chair, I move to conditionally approve application number 2023-COA-141 for the phase two design details at 1446-1448 Stewart Street as per design guidelines 4.1 to 4.3, 4.5 to 4.8, 4.16, 4 4.18 to 4.20, 5.5 to 5.6, 5.18, character defining features for the A. Spangler House, presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, inset all windows at least two inches into the wall plane and two, design front yard fencing to be at least 50% open. And thank you. Second. Second. Very has seconded it. Thank you very much. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. All right. We are again unanimous in our approval of 2023 COA 141, 1446, 1448 Stewart Street. Um, on to our next and our last design review project. Um, it's Jesse's project. It's 2023 COA 135. One at, at one three three five dash one three four five Grant Street in Civic Center. Yes, you have. Oh no! <laughs> I'll uh, hop right on in a second. All right. Uh, so this is a, a mass form and context review for uh, 1335, 1345 Grant Street located in the Civic Center Historic District. Uh, the Civic Center Historic District was designated as a local historic district in 1976. Um, it does have a period of significance of 1909 to 1979, as outlined in the Civic Center design guidelines. It is composed of 22 buildings, three of which are individual landmarks, and 14 uh, are contributing features. Um, and you can see additional information on the dist local district um, map and the application packet on page eight. The district was made up of mostly civic and institutional buildings with two religious structures and three multifamily residential structures. Key buildings in the local historic district near the proposed development site include the Colorado State Capitol and the First Baptist Church of Denver, as well as the Colorado State Museum. Additional buildings close in proximity to the development site and within the period of significance include Alma Temple and Harcourt Arms. And you have a close up here of the block as well as an overall district view. May take a second for it to give me control. Okay, there we go. Okay, Civic Center was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1988 and is made up of 18 buildings, two structures, and 12 objects. Pictured on the left is a close-up view of the National Register district map around the, uh, the building site. <clears throat> and you can see the full um, district map on um, in the application packet. Um, so this district, again, is composed of 18 buildings, um, 12 are contributing, and uh, you can find that full district map on page six of the application packet. Key contributing buildings in the National Register District near the proposed development site include the Colorado State Capitol, the First Baptist Church of Denver, and the Colorado State Museum. And then in 2013, Civic Center was designated as a National Historic Landmark. Pictured on the right is a close-up view of the NHL map. Uh, the NHL is composed of 27 buildings and features, 18 of which are contributing to the district. Uh, see the district or the National Historic Landmark District map on page seven of the application packet. Uh, National Historic Landmark designations are reserved for historic buildings, sites, structures, objects, and uh, districts that represent outstanding aspects of American history and culture. Uh, the state of Colorado has a total of 26 NHLs, uh, two of which are located in Denver, and those include the Denver Civic Center um, Park, or Denver Civic Center, and then the Red Rocks Park. 
Um, and I would like the reason why I'm bringing these two di districts up is that um, the district boundaries between the local, national, NHL um, uh, vary, and uh, the commission's focus should be on the district guidelines, the design guidelines, and the local designated historic district. So additionally, the proposed site is close in proximity to two individual landmarks that are not located within the district boundaries. That's the Aramore Apartments uh, building located at 225 East 13th Avenue, which is here to the south. Um, and then it was constructed in 1928 and was designated as an individual landmark in 2000. Um, the structure is located approximately 53 feet to the south of the proposed development, is four stories in height, or four stories and is 55 feet in height. Um, and then the second individual landmark within proximity is the Scottish Rite Masonic Temple, located at 1370 Grant Street. It was constructed, um, or it was constructed in 1918 and was designated as an individual landmark in 1989. The structure is located approximately 119 feet to the northeast of the proposed development, is two stories, and is 79 feet in height. Um, so although these structures are not located within the district boundaries, uh, the commission may still consider the potential impact of the new structure on the surrounding locally designated historic landmarks as locally, desig uh, land lo locally designated landmarks are within your review purview. Um, so the applicant is proposing uh, a 12-story um, approximately 150 foot uh, multifamily residential structure on a vacant parking lot uh, at 1335, 1345 Grant Street, located within the locally designated Civic Center Historic District boundaries. The district is zoned CMX 8 with the opportunity for additional height incentives for residential projects that comply with the DRMC. Um, section 27-224.C.1.B and for meeting all requirements of the affordability policy. The application proposes to meet zoning and affordability policy requirements by devoting 20%, that's 47 out of 234 of its units to affordable housing. It is important to note that while zoning allows eight stories in this district, landmark requirements can be more restrictive depending on the impact to the local historic district context. Um, something else I would like to note here too is that there are some inconsistencies between the three-dimensional design, particularly at the cap. Um, they show two bump outs here that are not shown in the elevation drawings or the plan view drawings of this floor or this cap. So staff would uh, need clarification on that um, in the final application. Um, the new building is set back 10 feet from Grant Street and a, set, uh, a setback that is consistent with 1329 Grant Street, the Adams at Grant, um, and 2030 East 14th Street, which is the First Baptist Church of Denver. The buildings will have a 10-foot uh, side setback from the First Baptist, Ch Baptist Church of Denver um, and the Adams, and Grant Adams at Grant buildings. Uh, to the north and south of the of the site. Uh, and this does fit within the range of setbacks in the immediate area. Finally, the new building will have a one foot rear setback along the alley, fitting in with the range of setbacks near the immediate uh, area. And here's an additional site plan showing the setbacks at the ground floor. Um, just for additional information, you can view that in your packet as well. The first floor of the building will be used as parking and the building and building amenities with additional subterranean parking on P2 to P5. See additional parking plans on page 16 of the application packet. 
Parking will be accessed off the alley to the west and the amenities leasing off, which is composed of leasing office and fitness and office center will be accessed off the Grant Street um, side of the site, which is to the east. Floors 11 through 12 will be composed of residential units and will feature a footprint of approximately 119 feet 9 inches by 96 feet uh, 0 inches. The east wall of floors 11 through 12 will feature roughly a 6 foot um, uh, by 89 foot shift in wall plane. Um, the applicant is proposing a rooftop area that will include two rooftop accesses. Um, mechanical closets, a pergola slash canopy, and solar panels. Um, the uh, rooftop footprint will measure approximately 119 feet 9 inches by 81 feet 7 inches. The applicant did not provide height details for these rooftop features in their elevation drawings, um, and that will need to be provided to staff uh, before final review. Um, so the new construction will be approximately 150 feet in height, as previously stated, to the 12th floor, and will have a total of 12 stories. This does not include the height of the 12th floor cornice or the rooftop features. Um, we will need that information. Um, the applicant has defined floors 1 through 3 as the base, floors 6 through 10 as the middle, and floors 11 and 12 as the cap. Staff would like to note uh, that the building cap varies between pages 20 through 22 of the application packet, and they will need to clarify that in their final application. Uh, staff did request that the applicant include heights on the east elevation comparison shown here. Um, the applicant did not include those measurements, so it is unclear what the floor-to-floor -floor heights are and how they align with the neighboring uh, buildings and or, and or what the overall building heights are for adjacent buildings and what the impact could possibly be. Staff have concerns uh, about the proposed number of stories, overall building height, and potential visual impact uh, of the new construction on the surrounding historic context. Uh, Civic Center's buildings are mostly two to eight stories in height, with one exception, the Ralph L. Carr Colorado Judicial Center, say that 10 times fast, <laughs> which is four to 12 stories in height and uh, an overall height of 184 feet. The Ralph L. Carr building was construction was construction, excuse me, was constructed outside of the period of significance for the district and is roughly 160 feet to the southwest of the state capitol building and has a grade that is approximately 23 feet lower than the state capitol building and approximately 17 feet lower than the proposed development site. Um, so here you have an image showing. Um, the state capitol uh, on the left, uh, the First Baptist Church, you can just see the steeple, um, the proposed site location, and then the Ralph L. Carr uh, building uh, on the right. I've also included here a spreadsheet of uh, building um, addresses, building names, dates of construction, number of stories, and building overall building heights. Um, within this district for your review so you can see um, kind of the range of heights and stories in this district. In addition to the overall impact of uh, the proposed building height on the district as a whole, staff have concerns over the impact over the um, uh, in the immediate block context. 1335-1345 Grant Street abuts five buildings. Uh, the First Baptist Church of Denver, which is an individual landmark to the north. Um, the uh, Adams at Grant building to the south. Um, the um, and the Alma Temple, Hall Court Arms, and Colorado State Museum buildings um, to the west. Uh, the First Baptist Church of Denver is located at 2030 East 14th Avenue, is two stories, and is roughly 150 feet in height to the uh, top of the spire. The Adams at Grant, located at 1329 Grant Street, is two stories and 28 feet in height. 
Alma Temple, uh, located at 1340. Sherman Street is three stories and is 67 feet in height. The Harcourt Arms, located at 1350 Sherman Street, is a four-story building and is 38 feet in height. And then the Colorado State Museum, located at 200 East 14th Avenue, is a four-story building and is 73 feet in height. The new construction will be approximately 307 feet to the south of the Colorado State Capitol building um, and uh, will be uh, which is located at 101 East 14th Avenue and is 180 feet in height to the top of the dome. The applicant uh, included additional compatibility demonstrations, which you can view on pages 17 through 19 of the application packet if you would like. Uh, staff would like to note that the applicant has included several buildings on these pages that are not in uh, not located within the district boundaries. The commission's focus should be on the historic buildings located in the district boundaries. Staff feel that the new construction will have a significant impact on the surrounding historic contact and context and could potentially interrupt views of neighboring buildings and individual landmarks, as well as the state capitol building. Um, the building appears to be mo designed mostly in the neoclassical style. Um, the proposed design draws from existing neoclassical and Art Deco style buildings in the district, uh, particularly strong vertical elements uh, and details similar to those found on the State Services Building. Um, and cornice horizontal banding and classical elements like those found on the Colorado State Museum. And then um, prominent entry base, similar to the one found on the state capitol annex. The East Grant Street building facade features a glassy storefront first floor anchored at the ends by solid columns. Uh, the building will feature a central entry, um, um, excuse me, will feature a central two story uh, entry bay. Um, the plan view, of the entry doors are reset, show that the doors are recessed. However, it's unclear uh, from the drawings if the central bay will be proud of the facade or coplanar with a material change. Additional clarif clarification will be needed in phase two of the design for this portion of the building. Uh, the first three floors are broken up um, into uh, three parts. So there's the storefront, at the first floor, the entry bay here, and then the second and third floors here and here uh, with three separate horiz uh, horizontal banding details here, here, and here. Um, staff feel that the three separate banding details add to a complex design for the building base and feel that um, it needs to be more clearly defined and simplified. Additionally, the cornice above the storefronts is substantial in size, uh, adding visual weight at the first floor of the base and competing with the third floor cornice, which demarcates the uh, top of the building base. Staff feel that the east elevation base would benefit from uh, simplification potentially by converting the storefront cornice into a simple uh, lintel or I-beam um, and then extending the height of the uh, two-story entryway to um, blend in with the uh, base cornice. Uh, so the east facade's middle features strong uh, vertical detailing and punched window openings, as well as regular window rhythms and layouts, uh, and a clearly defined cornice, um, which is found uh, on other buildings in this district. The east facade's cap is broken into three uh, bays and is made up of two floors. Um, the center bay steps up in height and bumps out roughly six feet in footprint from the north and south bays, um, a configuration that's not typical of the district. So staff recommend that the building cap should be main, should maintain a uh, regular cornice height and footprint, and, but and are also supportive uh, of the building uh, cap being inset to uh, 
minimize the visual weight of that cap or the overall height of the building. Uh, the north and south elevations base is composed of three stories. The northeast and southeast corners of the first floor feature partial continuation of the storefront. Um, while the north, uh, west, uh, and southwest corners show individual openings. Um, <clears throat> page 22 uh, shows a cantilever, it does appear here at this front corner um, on both sides of the building. Um, this will need, need to be corrected in the final drawing set. The base is interrupted at the first floor with a heavy cornice that wraps the building. Staff recommend eliminating the first floor cornice and maintaining a third floor, uh, the third floor cornice as a means of better defining and simplifying the base. Staff are uh, also recommend creating alignment between the first floor openings and the second and third floor window openings on this northwest and southwest corners. The north and south elevations middle features, again, strong vertical detailing, punched window openings, regular window rhythms and layouts and clearly defined cornice, uh, which is typical of this district. The north and south elevation cap steps back roughly six feet and footprint on the northeast and southeast corners, a configuration that is not typical of the district. Additionally, the cornice height does not appear to match the shift in cornice height on the east elevation, and this will be need to be corrected um, in the final drawing set. Staff feel that the building cap should maintain a regular cornice height and footprint. And again, staff are support, supportive of the building cap being smaller um, in footprint than the middle and the base, but recommend removing that shift in wall plane uh, on the east. Okay. Um, the west elevation base is composed of three stories. The northwest and the southwest first floor corners feature garage entrances with no other openings at the first floor. The base is interrupted at the first floor with a heavy cornice that wraps the building. Staff recommend eliminating the first floor cornice and maintaining the third floor cornice as a means of better defining and simplifying the base. Staff also recommend the addition of faux window openings or actual window openings at the first floor to break up the void between the garage doors. The second and third floor portions of the building feature two vertical pilaster, uh, pilasters that align with the pilasters on the fourth through 10th floors seen here and here. Um, the pilaster detail is not shown on any of the other base elevations um, and staff recommend eliminating that so that um, it maintains a consistent base appearance from elevation to elevation and a clear delineation between the uh, base, middle, and cap of the building. Uh, the west elevation's cap features a regular cornice height and no shifts in wall plane, which are supported by staff. However, the cap does appear to have window rhythms and layouts that are dissimilar from the east, north, and south layouts. Staff recommend a restudy of the rhythms and layouts of the windows on the west elevation cap. Oh, um, one last thing um, that staff would like to mention that I didn't cover in the staff brief was the use of balconies um, on the building. This is atypical of the district, but may be appropriate on a residential structure. Um, but we wanted to bring that up so that uh, the commission could provide feedback during deliberation um, on those balconies. Uh, pictured here is an elevation study showing the sight line uh, from the street. Additional line of sight images can be found on sheets 28 through 34 of your application packet. Please note that these Im images do not depict do do not depict the proposed building. And then pictured here are three dimensional drawings for the proposed buildings. Additional images can be found on sheets 11. 
Um, the staff highly recommend uh, that additional three-dimensional drawings be created, showing the visual impact of the structure on the surrounding buildings. The application packet may also benefit from a shadow study, which we have reviewed or, or uh, required in the past for more complex sites such as this, uh, but it is not an overall application requirement. Um, or the landmark staff is recommending denial of the proposed application, citing design guidelines 4.2 through 4.6, 4.8, 4.22 through 4.25, or excuse me, 4.26, and then 4.28, 4.31, intent statements 4A, 4B, 4C, 4G, 4H, 4I, and Civic Center Design Guidelines uh, 4.C.1, 4.C.2, and 4.E.3. Um, and I would also like to note that the applicant did include um, their own presentation, which Brittany will bring up here in a second. Thank you, Jacob. Sure. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions? Just appropriate now or later, but... Um, this site is zoned for eight stories, but they're taking advantage of a uh, initiative from the city council that additional stories can be added for uh, providing for uh, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Is the affordable if that happens, is the affordable housing provision uh, perpetual, or is it limited in time? In other words, the first time. Yeah. You know, in other words, if, um, and, and I don't really understand the incentives for affordable housing very much, except to know that there's criticism of those kind of plans because they're not very long in duration. And I don't know what the situation is here. So that's why the question is, is um, if this project were to be approved and if the additional stories would be granted because affordable housing is included, is that provision for having affordable housing as perpetual as the existing. Program. I see what you're saying. So you're saying basically if they are getting these additional stories or uh, additional yeah stories for this structure, do those units always have to be affordable right. um, to meet that requirement? Right. Um, that would probably be a good uh, question. Um, for the applicant, I can also find additional information on that provision. But that's really a matter of zoning, right? Yeah. So Not our purview, yes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Really yes. Yeah. And I, I have a question. So the boundary specifically includes the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And there, am I correct that there was a structure that was previously on the parking lot? Yes, you can see that in my staff uh, packet. I believe it was residential structures. And can you, um, that come down before the, the line was drawn? Yes, those came down before, well before the, so that, those buildings, so yeah. When the, line, when, the, when the boundary was drawn, that site was a parking lot. Is that correct? Correct, yes. And, but the buildings on both sides of the site are individual landmarks. No, just the First Baptist Church of Denver is an individual landmark. The one to the south is included in the district boundaries, but is not um, an individual landmark. I'm, I'm, wait, I'm a little confused. So there's the Adams at Grant to the south. And then the Armour apartments are outside of the district of boundaries here. But, but it's a big, right? And that's an individual landmark, but there's a building in between. A little building. Correct. I see. So there's there's the the church, a parking lot, and then a spot, and then another individual landmark. So the lot and then another. Yep. Landmark. So this is here is the church, the vacant lot. This is the Adams at Grant structure to the south here. And then there's the individual landmark. I see what you're indicating too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's not showing no, my mouse. But I think it's a yeah. highlighter to what we can do. Okay. But I think I get it that the, um, the building at the south end of the block 
is an individual landmark, but it's not in the district. And then there's a spot. Thank you. Correct. Okay. Um, can we just uh, is the applicant here? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, Hello. We've got uh, 10 minutes to talk about your application. And I think we just begin uh, with your name and address. And if, I don't know if both those speak, yes. but you'll need to do your name and address as well. Can you hold on one second? Uh, I will hold up your PowerPoint. Absolutely. <laughs> Be able to read it. <laughs> um, also, let me know when you um, want me to uh, change um, the slides because you won't have ability to, to control them. Okay. So, um, Thank you. Um, hello, good afternoon. I'm Kate Arano at 7122 Swadley Court in Arvada, and I'm the owner's representative for the First Baptist Church of Denver, which is affiliated with the American Baptist Churches USA. Um, with me today, we have Jackie Loftus, chair of the church council, Brian Henderson, our minister, and Kenton Kuhn, chair of the property committee. I am also joined by Jen Carpenter, our architect from LAI Design. Um, first, I'd like to thank our community, the Landmark staff, and all of you uh, for your passion for, for preserving our rich history. We're looking forward to working with you to create a building that all of Denver can be proud of and are thrilled to hear your feedback today. We've been really waiting for this moment. The First Baptist Church of Denver has had a congregation since 1864. Today is actually our 159th birthday. We have been in our current building since 1937. And as you know, our current building is a landmark, which we are very proud of. First Baptist Church is committed to serving the community in the most fundamental and needed ways. We have a long history of feeding the hungry, sheltering the houseless, and providing refuge during the most critical times in our history. For example, we were the first property owners to host a safe outdoor space, have participated for many years in the Women's Homeless Initiative, and are working with the Safe Parking Initiative to provide women with a safe and legal space to sleep at overnight. The congregation of the church feels very strongly that they want to build a beautiful building that evokes both the, both the church next door and the state capitol across the street. This is our place. It's our home. This is our community. And this is extremely important to all of us. We want to sustain this for another 159 years. With increasing taxes, complex and ever-growing social needs, Security risks that come with a mid-block parking lot and limited funding were struggling to serve the community as it deserves to be served. We seek to develop this parking lot to continue to provide resources to the community, grow our outreach programs, provide some affordable housing and market rate housing, improve safety on our block and support the operations of the church for generations to come. We have asked for your approval to build at the maximum height with the affordable housing incentives because at 12 stories, we are able to provide the most affordable housing units. We are not an out-of-state developer or a large for-profit conglomerate. We are the community in Denver and will remain in place next door to this development. And next slide, please. And as you can see here, this is the existing site. Next slide, please. And as you can see here, this is just a little bit more into 
the designation. We do sit just inside the boundary um, with the parking lot at the edge within the local district. Next slide, please. Um, and here you can see the national map, which we fall outside of, which was actually revised um, to remove the parking lot. And this map is as of 1988. Next slide, please. And I will now hand it over to Jen, our architect. Uh, Jennifer Carpenter, I'm a principal with LAI Design Group. We are at 88 Inverness Drive East in Inglewood. Um, thank you very much. Like um, Kate said, we are been waiting for this moment to get in front of you, the commissioners. Um, we started this process over a year ago and um, in your packets, we have a, a little bit of a dialogue, but we have gone through two rounds of comments with staff. Everyone has given us a release to proceed. We are waiting on landmark. Landmark also, um, or I'm sorry, zoning and urban design are waiting for their approvals once we get your approval. So that's one of the processes. We, we thought we were gonna get released. Um, we've gotten some mixed um, feedback, but we're here now. Um, we're, we're ready to keep going. You guys are holding the key so this opportunity can happen. So looking closer at our site, we're at about 19,000 square feet. This will be an infill, as Kate mentioned, um, I think, and even the community members, they're looking forward to having something in this parking lot. Um, we will also be um, definitely increasing the street activation, the transparency meeting, all the uh, zoning and urban design. Um, and also it's, I think it's just gonna be great. I know a lot of people from the Capitol come to the cafe in the church. So this will be another place where they can come in, they can grab lunch, um, even have some of the studio um, spaces or one bedrooms, you know, that could be available to people who work there as far as also families and people who are needing the affordable housing. It was asked earlier, um, the affordable housing, once it's designated, it will continue. So it is there, we're not gonna remove it. Um, so just real quickly, I've outlined some of the key things that came from the staff report, which mentioned things like the vehicular access from the alley, that we meet the typical setbacks, that we've positioned the front of our building to create a uniform streetscape, and that our entrance um, is actually recessed that goes in line with other buildings in the area. One thing that we have discovered during the process is this boundary shows up on paper, but not when you're walking around the community. So we feel that, you know, when you look across the street, we actually started with a building that was all brick. When we got into the LPC, if you go to the next slide, we start looking more at the buildings that are non-residential and civic in nature. So it's kind of good that we stripped off the materials right now. So we're just looking at the actual form and the massing. Um, in the packets, we've taken um, a survey of a lot of the structures and we kind of narrowed it down to two each. So these are things like the cornice, the cap, the window rhythms, having a base, a middle and a top. Um, also, you know, it's kind of mixed review as if the top floors or the caps are pushed in or not. We are open to meeting all of the design context features. Um, next slide, please. Um, so a big key for us was discovering that the car building, which was built outside of the period of significance is actually 12 stories. Um, and it actually blocks the view of the Capitol. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of how are we going to, you know, continue to fit into a community with residential in a community. So I feel like where we're at right now, we've answered all of these questions and all of these requirements. The next slide please shows directly adjacent and then also a bird's eye view of the buildings that are eight and 12 stories. Next slide. And I'm sorry if I'm talking fast, I know I'm coming up on my time. Um, so we received comments. Um, we've, we've done two submittals to Landmark to get to you guys today. We also did um, receive the staff report on the 24th. Typically in municipalities, when we receive comments, we like to respond to those comments. I actually did a presentation that addressed every single comment that was given to us. We had no problem. Um, when we submitted our presentation, we were asked to remove all of those. So we have a design ready to go that meets every single. So if you go to the next slide, this kind of outlines, there's really seven main things that were repeated through the um, staff report. And we actually have elevations that meet all of these. 
Um, in regards to balconies, that was a new comment that we heard today. Um, our base does not have balconies. Our, our middle and our cap um, is where the balconies would be located. Um, the next slide, please. So as this is the same graphic that's in your image or in your packet, we wanted to show that if and when somebody to the south of us decided to build to the eight stories, this is what it would look like. The next slide shows a different view with the same um, structures per the zoning that it would be allowed to do eight. And the one on the very end, they could do eight plus the additional four if they decided to go to affordable housing. Um, we can skip over the next two slides. Um, when we finally got to sit down with staff, um, we talked about the view plane and we were told, there is uh, one more slide, please. We were told that there's something called this kind of, it's the unofficial view plane. So at eye level, what do you see? Well, we walked our entire block, more than one block, and show you at eye level with research, which is about five foot six, this is what you see. This is where you're at. And then finally, our next slide, I'm just going to kind of go over it. I just want to hit some facts here before you guys cut me off. Um, we started on this journey to provide a solution for the current obvious housing crisis affecting Denver and specifically the community, which the church is, they live, they work, they play in this area. Our vision is to maximize the value of the resources in a way that will provide financial stability for the ministry. Okay. Commissioners, do you have any questions for the well, I have provided an answer to the question. I guess I don't know if that is a that's a legal commitment or just a verbal one um, because I don't understand that setup. Um, I do have a question about uh, how many units total and how many of those units are intended to be affordable. And as I understand, affordable housing there's different ranges of affordability. Mm -hmm. and, um, the of the right. You're correct. So right now where it stands is that would be designated once we get into the site plan submittal, but from the ordinance itself as it stands, there's kind of a minimum of 12%. And then it splits into what's considered a market rate or a high market, depending on what the surrounding area projects. Right now, we are at a minimum, we'll do 12 or 20%. That's our minimum. And depending on our stories and how our unit configurations work out, um, that 20% will increase. So we've made a commitment to do 20%. In order to get through the four extra stories, you only have to do 12. 12. So I have a question. So you just said, so you said you've made a commitment and so the church is working with a private equity or I guess it's how the funding is coming for the church. So their loan. And when we run the performa, they are able to provide at a minimum 20% with the 12 stories. And as the stories come down, the commitment and the units lessen. So, and that will be stated on our application for the affordability incentives so that it's all in writing um, for our commitment at 20% at 12 kind of like Yeah, kind of like a development agreement, but we make the agreement with the individuals who run the affordable housing. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for you? Yeah. Um, I uh, walked the area and kept uh, the application materials with me, spent about 20 minutes in the parking lot, which unlike the picture you showed was full. Where do those people go? Are you going to offer public parking in, in the building? Yeah, so those people that are parked there are um, actually mostly folks from the church. Um, and, and we're also required because we have the little cafe on the first floor. And so, yes, we are going to be providing parking within the parking garage to replace that parking. Because that's all I have for you. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any people from the public? Okay. All right. Uh, do we have anyone virtually joining us that would like to make a good? I do see a couple hands. That's great. Excellent. Starting with Bradley. That's great. So starting with Bradley. Starting with Bradley. Okay. Great. 
Um, all right, let's just review real quickly uh, public comments for design review. Um, you've got your, um, please make sure you've got your hands raised. Uh, give your name and address uh, at the beginning of your two minutes, and we'll have a little time where you can say it. Don't worry about your time. So, um, is the app, or I'm sorry, is the person on this thing? Uh, yes, thank you. Bradley, if you'd like to unmute, turn your camera on, you can. All right, can you hear me? We can't hear you. All right, great. Uh, my name is Brad Cameron. I live at 1200 Humboldt Street. And um, first of all, I just, I do want to start off by really uh, thanking the church. They are a wonderful asset for the community uh, and are involved in so many aspects uh, and, are, and just do wonderful work. And obviously, this uh, desire for affordable housing is just a continuation of that. So I'm very appreciative. But um, I, I just have to, to join in with staff raising a concern, primarily focused on the height, the 12 stories. Um, you know, when you look at the, the materials in the packet, and, and uh, you know, particularly, uh, I think on page 23, which is the, the graphic that shows how it would line up with the state capitol. I mean, it really is a, a very large building being proposed very close to the capitol. Uh, you know, the comments about the Ralph Carr building, you know, the 12 the story portion of that is all the way down on 13th Avenue and of course down the hill. And uh, of course it should be noted, uh, the state certainly didn't go through any design review with landmark preservation on that. Um, so that's primarily the concern. Obviously the question is, well, well, fine, if 12 stories is too much, where do you put it? And uh, again, the, you know, the, the affordable housing ordinance is, is uh, I think a, a, a great opportunity for the city as a whole to add more housing, but perhaps maxing it out at the 12 stories here is just not appropriate and perhaps uh, reducing it to something like 10 stories or, or more of a compromise might be the approach. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, next we have Cheryl. Okay. Hi, can you hear us? <coughs> they need to unmute. Cheryl, can you hear us? I don't think it should end over. No, she didn't turn on up again. Cheryl, you can unmute and turn on your camera if you'd like now. There, I'm sorry about that. I apologize. Um, I can turn my camera too. Okay. Hello. <laughs> my name is Cheryl Powell, um, 5738 Old Wadsworth in Arvada, Colorado. Um, my company is Rocky Mountain Commercial uh, Associates, and I have been working with um, the First Baptist Church of Denver on this project. And um, I wanted to just give my feedback. I I am a native. And... Yeah. Are you part of the applicant team? I'm I'm not. I am um I'm actually on the outside. <laughs> I started um with a, a broker opinion of value. Um would you consider me on the team if I did that a year and a half ago? I'm gonna restart your time um since we had some discussion <laughs> there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go okay. ahead. Two minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Cheryl Powell, and I my office is at 5738 Old Wadsworth in Arvada, Colorado, my company, Rocky Mountain Commercial Associates. Um, I helped First Baptist Church of Denver um, look at their land as they wanted to, and the value of that land um, a couple years ago, as they really wanted to make an impact on the community. Um, as I've looked at um, their packets and reviewed and had discussions um, and asked questions. I know that all of the church and this committee that is sitting there in your room want to do is, is make an impact on the community. Um, I know that they're also really willing to, to work with you uh, to, to do what's best. Um, I think that they have a mission uh, and what they've done is they've made changes to the community that I don't think there's 
many other churches around that have. And this project in particular allows them to continue to do that for a lot of reasons. But um, my background is multifamily commercial real estate. And I have to say, I've not worked with a client yet that wants to exceed the affordable housing minimums. And um, this is a group of people that want to make that impact. So um, I just wanted to to call in and support um, since I worked with them, you know, from in the beginning on that value. And um, I'm hoping that you will be in favor of some sort of project for them. Um, hopefully this one. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, next. Jackie, you should be able to turn on your camera and unmute whenever you're ready. Hello, Jackie. Hi, sorry, that took a minute. Um, and I apologize, my computer's having issues, so my camera is not working. Um, I'm Jackie Zlesniak at 1280 South Gaylord Street in Denver. Um, I have lived in the 80210 uh, zip code for the past 25 years. Um, and I just wanted to comment because I'm also a registered lobbyist, which means I spend a lot of my time down at the Capitol. Um, and so I'm very, very familiar with the area and I'm very excited for the possibility of actually creating, you know, new, beautiful residential space that's mixed use that has, you know, restaurants or shops on the main floor. Um, and yet would also work with the city to really enhance the affordable housing crisis that we really are all in. I mean, I am down there. Um, at this time of year, every day, often coming in the building when it's dark, leaving when it's dark. And um, one of my friends this year actually gave me a personal alarm because of the state of, you know, the, the way the city is with the people around that just are, are going through a rough time in life. And so anything we can do to gentrify that area, especially with um, the commitment of the church to really continue to serve everyone there, I can validate the fact that I go to the Spring Cafe often. Um, I also know people that, you know, park in their parking lot um, and knowing that they will then extend that parking into the building um, is also helpful. So I understand that the Historic Commission may have some concern, but I will tell you that this is such an opportunity that I would hate for the city to pass up. Um, I think allowing everyone to be able to live where they work um, is an amazing feat and it's getting harder and harder to do. So for people to actually come in and want to do that voluntarily, I really commend the church for all of their work. And I really do hope that the commission considers um, approving their application today. Thank you. Jackie, thank you. All right, next. Adam, you can turn on your camera and unmute whenever you're ready. Hello, Adam, are you there? Yes, sorry about that. It was uh, taking a minute to log on here. Oh, hey, thank, <laughs> thank, thank you again for uh, for the opportunity to speak here and appreciate the collaboration. I'm Adam McGowan. I am at 1935 Logan Street. Um, so I'm in the neighborhood. I'm in a in an area with a lot of of existing 12 story buildings. I don't. I I understand the the plain view, but I think this is too important to add affordable housing. Um, I see what the church does and it's really impactful on the community. It's more than just a, a historic landmark that offices are in. Um, and I, I would hate to see uh, an opportunity for them uh, not go through. And I, I think that looking at the National Historic District, I think this would fit, even though it may not be with in the local boundaries. I, I just think it's too important of a project. I don't think 12 stories is outlandish um, for this, this area being that, you know, two blocks over everywhere starts turning into that. Uh, I also deal with the capital market across the street as a wholesaler for them. And I know they were excited about this opportunity to bring in, um, again, a little bit more safety rather than just a vacant parking lot, bringing more vibrance to, to that area. Um, so I, I would just want to voice as a, a neighbor uh, support for this project. Great, Adam, thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm.
Hi, Scott, are you there? Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. It just it just kicked him over to, to panelists. Give it a second. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. Hang it, hang with us for a second. Scott, you'll have to unmute again. There, is that good? There yeah. you go. <laughs> All right, no trouble. Hey, my name is uh, Scott Piggy. I'm at 7624 East Colgate. I work around the area and the, the church is so civically involved, but I always follow what they're doing. I just wanted to encourage the commission today to really to continue to work with the church and uh, let them continue through the process. It would be hard to imagine that an institution that is almost as old as the city would do anything to degrade the value of their own building. And as I visit with the minister and staff there, I've come to learn one of the reasons they're developing themselves is to really maintain control and to preserve the neighborhood and that make sure that there's the right level of affordable housing. I heard the concerns on that. And, you know, the city council didn't do the neatest thing on that expansion, but they never really do. But let's just imagine, would the church really want to abandon the commitment to affordable housing? We're talking about an institution in our neighborhood that has done everything almost unimaginable to secure shelter for people from within their own basement to parking in the parking lot to having tents in the parking lot. These stopgap measures that are approved by this city, but really aren't housing. So if they were to abandon that commitment, it would just perpetuate work that they've done in our city for over a century. I think that they are a trusted partner. They are the literal old kid on the block. I heard them today be responsive to feedback and willing to, to reconsider things. My last point is about these view planes. And, you know, the city overall, and I'm not talking about you all, it's gone through the last 20 years, hasn't been the best at protecting its historic value. I think this is a really good right start. Uh, I was looking at the revised code in chapter 10 that, that talks about the view planes. But I heard a concern of the staff today that's not actually in the city code. And I wasn't sure if staff can have these sort of unofficial uh, official concerns or think that they're going to ask city council to move the capital another. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, sorry. Um, well, we don't bump anyone, but Scott, your time to do that. I'm afraid we had a little trouble with the connection, but your time is up. No, no trouble. That was it. I was just saying to, to continue to work with them because they did seem to be responsive to your concerns and that of the community. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Okay, Taylor, is there anybody else? Other? No other hands. Okay, great. Um, was there any, did you, the staff want to make any additional yes. comments? Okay. Um, I did want to note uh, in the application or the applicant presentation at page 11, they had additional use for potential eight story buildings. Again, the building directly uh, south of the parking lot is that within the district boundaries is within the period of significance. And then the building on the other side of that is an individual landmark. So. All of that would have to be reviewed by the commission. I know for uh, on the individual landmark likelihood of you allowing them to be demolished in any sort of structure put in these places. Um, and then I would also additionally note um, that the drawings do not show that cap again correctly. Um, and uh, staff. Uh, requested that the applicant remove uh, proposed designs um, or revisions to the design, um, waiting for uh, the commission to provide deliberation, deliberation today. And also because we require a four week filing deadline uh, in order for staff to review, provide comments, um, and then the commission just gets a week to review that application material as well. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Jesse? No. no. Okay, great. All right, uh, commissioners, let us go into deliberation. <clears throat>
I can start. All right. can start. Thank you. Um, um, uh, first of all, I, you know, the applicant uh, did a great job, and uh, you made it very clear your heart's in the right place uh, relative to what you're trying to achieve, and I, I don't fault you for uh, doing your best to maximize the value of your property uh, and do the right thing by the community, so that's very much appreciated. Um, I appreciate staff uh, and uh, the detail within the report. Uh, and, the, and generally agree with uh, the overall uh, conclusions. The one thing that, uh, one point that I would want to make is relative to uh, 4.23 uh, that states uh, the criteria that maintain typical spacing patterns created by the repetition of historic building widths along the street. Um, I, I think you know, uh, the architect in their presentation pointed to a number of buildings that are neoclassical or federal in style in the district, but the, the common, common thing that they had around them was blue sky. So it, it, it wasn't an overwhelming mass. These, these massive buildings, even though they're four or six or eight stories, stand on their own relative to the sky, given their separation from the adjacent buildings. Uh, and so for me, what that means uh, relative to the criteria in looking at the application or the design uh, put forth in the application is we're creating a street wall that uh, is out of context given the scale of this building. So this massive square that's 12 stories tall uh, is, is where I have an issue relative to the criteria. Uh, I don't generally have a problem with height. I think that can be solved with massing and breaking down the massing in a number of ways. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, try to do that. Uh, and then the same thing with the street wall and the fabric of, you know, uh, vehicular traffic, pedestrian traffic in that district. Uh, just keep in mind uh, the, the, the rhythm of the buildings and the open space. Um, and so given all that, I, I think that the, the building as proposed is, is out of context, uh, not diving into the cornice heights, the base, the middle, the cap, all of that detail aside, I think the, the mass is the real issue in the district. Thank, thank you. I, I agree with uh, what you're saying, Nick, that all the other large buildings in the district do not crowd the property lines and, and give space to see not only the rest of the district, but the sky. I mean, I think that was an excellent, uh, I couldn't, I was trying to figure out <laughs> why I thought the building was too big in context. And that's and that's it. It just blocks the sky from so many different viewpoints. Um, so I, I, I think that any, any proposal for this site is gonna have to not only um, decide how the three parts of the building relate to the street, but how you can see around the corners of the building to the other buildings in the district. Um, it's just, um, it's easy to say the building is too large, but that's right. what makes it too large is it doesn't respond to the context of the district. Um, even the taller buildings have space around them and space above them. Yep, I agree. And I think once you solve for that, it'll solve for views to the capital. Uh, it'll just sort of come to be. And on the other hand, I'd like to, I mean, there's there's no question in my mind, I, I'm, I live, kind of nearby, and I know the uh, First Baptist's commitment to dealing with uh, difficult issues, the homeless issue, women's issues, so I don't doubt their motivation in the least. I just think that this building, while it uh, attempts to address some of those issues, it doesn't fit into the other aspects of the historic context in the neighborhood. George? Well, as I said, I was sitting there in the parking lot uh, and walking around trying to imagine 
this this building there and I agree with my colleagues here uh, that affordable housing is a necessity, but affordable housing as a phrase is, is simply a dog whistle. I don't know what that means. If we were talking subsidized housing for low income families, then I could get on board with that and understand what it is right away. As it is, I have to congratulate Jesse for noting all of those details in the drawings and in the application. Um, when I was just sitting there being overwhelmed by the picture of this 12 story building plopped in the, in the neighborhood. It, that's 4.4 .4 and uh, Civic Center 4C 1 and 2 um, about a, a matching or a contributing uh, size and scale. I can't do anything about the car building that was built before anybody was worrying about it. So it's, it's that one's not on the table. Um, and the, the, the affordable housing, I mean, it's noble, but it's not really an issue for us. So it's, uh, um, I have to absolutely agree with, uh, with staff that, uh, that the size and rendering of it is too much. Well, and I, you know, getting back to the car building as an example of why a 12 story building would be acceptable. What the car building has done is the tall part of the building is set back from 14th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so there's space around the Capitol. Um, this proposal would encroach in that space yeah. considerably. So, yeah. And the mass has been broken down in the right. building as it's well. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point you bring up. In that there's a vertical component that marries to the horizontal component in terms of what's emphasized right. and the two-story entry. Uh, so there, it, it's broken down where it doesn't feel as monolithic. I think that you, you mentioned another point about the street frontage and how it's one complete mass and it's not broken up horizontally. It's broken up vertically with the three, you know, the three parts of the building. But to fit in with the context of the neighborhood, smaller masses across the street would be, you know, some response to that breaking up that facade to um, kind of pay reference to the smaller buildings that are in the district. I agree. And so I have huge admiration for the First Baptist Church and their work, which I think is extraordinary, but it is unfortunately not our purview. And um, I'm going to look at guideline 4.4, .4, which says design the height, mass, and form of a new building to be compatible with the historic context and point A is design a new building to be within the typical range of building forms, heights, and sizes in the surrounding context block. And that's what we're looking at, the surrounding context block. Um, and so I actually look at this, I again, I, I look at this and one of the things that makes me most uncomfortable about it actually is its relationship to the church because it is so large and the church is so important and it's such a big, as everybody has said, and again, not our purview exactly, it's such a big part of the community that to do a building next to it that just wipes out the church, mm -hmm. I think is particularly unfortunate. But I would say that the first thing I would suggest the applicant looked at is 4.4 .4 and go down each of those points and make sure that you actually agree that you have actually, you've hit the, because I think that the 4.4 .4 is very specific in how you make an uh, infill project um, work in a historic um, context. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, it's not our purview. Affordable housing is not our purview. Um, I think we have a clear understanding that it is, even though we, we much admire um, your work, um, and we absolutely do want to work with you all. And we absolutely do. Um, it's just uh, I can't, I can't see a way forward from the twelve stories. It's just, it's, it doesn't fit right in, in, in my view. Are there any other comments that uh, commissioners would like to make that might help them when they come back to us? I think the answer. I, 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 I want to 
I don't know if I can articulate it very well. Um, I'm aware of a frequent criticism of historic preservation because it doesn't accommodate affordable housing. I think that's an unfortunate link. Um, it's often used to criticize uh, historic preservation. Um, I think the fact that neighborhoods um, can uh, seek designation as an example um, actually can in some ways make affordable housing more available in some cases. Um, and so I, I think it's it's unfortunate that historic preservation has the rap, has the reputation that it is against affordable housing. It is not. Um, but what it is about is about managing the kind of change that makes our environment livable. And um, uh, in this case, I think the change, it, it doesn't meet the guidelines that uh, Anne pointed out, that that's clear. But I also think that this is a, a change that goes too far. It's one of those kinds of changes that we'd be, even though it might achieve one thing that's a great thing, um, it is a, it would, the building as presented is too much of a disruption to the character of the neighborhood. I believe there's a lot of modest rent housing in the neighborhood as it is. Modest is, <laughs> modest isn't what it used to be. <laughs> no, I, but I, I live nearby and I'm aware of uh, the character of the neighborhood. I think this would be a designated neighborhood of bungalows that you've got enclave of affordable yeah. housing. Yeah, yeah. I used to live in Capitol Hill. It's a pretty high density neighborhood, actually. Um, any other comments for the applicants? Guys, comment on the balconies just so oh, they oh, good. Thank yes. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, 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 I would suggest, it, at least as I look at it, balconies, I don't object in this district. I, I don't think that they're, but but the materiality and the the uh, the ornamental nature of them, the way they're depicted, doesn't seem to fit. Yeah. Um, and so, it, I mean, there are ways to do it, uh, you know, creatively with recess balcony, you know, facades that lend themselves to balconies. And then instead of the wrought iron sort of residential feel, you can do it in glass or whatever. But uh, generally, I think there are uh, approaches that might. Uh, be more effective in keeping with the context. Um, any other comments? All right, do I hear a motion? Madam Chair. George. Uh, I move to deny application 2023 COA 135 for the new construction, 1335 through 1345 Grant Street, as per design guidelines 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.8, 4.22, 4.23, 4.24, 4.25, 4.26, 4.28, and 4.31, the intent statements 4A, 4B, 4C, 4G, 4H, and 4I, Denver Civic Center design guidelines 4C1, 4C2, 4E3, the presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. George, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Nick has seconded. All right. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All right. Um, the, the application is um, unanimously denied. Um, and we, we do hope to see you back. All right, uh, that is the end of our design review projects. Um, do we have any business items? We do not. Do we have any discussion items? We do not. We do not. <laughs> then we are adjourning the meeting at uh, four, or I'm sorry, three, four, eight. Almost tell time. <laughs>